Welcome back to our course in construction grammar. Today we look at the final theoretical bit, clausal constructions. Remember, throughout this course we said that constructions are the central unit of language. They are pairings of form and meanings, and all levels of our linguistic description are supposed to involve these four meaning pairs. Because the totality of language is a network of constructions known as the constructicon. In the last session, we looked at phrasal constructions, the fillers of argument structure construction slots, as well as phrases carrying out the functions of modifiers and adjuncts. Today, we take a look at the most abstract type of constructions, well, at least for now, and these are clausal constructions. What are the major sentence types of English? Well, you've got declarative clauses like Ben was tired, Ben made more mistakes. You've got WH interrogatives like what was Ben, what did he make? You've got yes-no interrogatives, was Ben tired, did he make mistakes? And imperatives, stay awake, don't make mistakes. There are more clause level constructions, um, for example, relative clauses, but we skip them for now. Let's focus on these four major sentence types um, in this presentation. Let's start with declarative clauses. Ben was tired and Ben made more mistakes normally are used to express statements. The constraints that they have, declarative clauses, is that we've got subject-verb agreement, so Ben was tired, they were tired, and that there's a falling intonation on the whole construct. The meaning of the whole thing then is statement. Again, as I said, there's much more we could say about declarative clauses, but for now, that's the major constraints that we need to associate with them. What about WH interrogatives? Well, we've got two types. In both of these instances, there's a WH element, who, what, and why, um, that functions in the sentence and that asks for the piece of information that you're interested in. In who was this and who made this, the thing that we ask for is the subject. In these cases, if who or what are in the subject slot, there is no difference in the word order. So for our construction, we can specify that we need a WH word in our WH subject interrogative clause construction, that it's got subject verb agreement, um, who were they, who is he, and that you get falling intonation on the whole construct. In contrast to this, if you ask for a non-subject element, what was Ben, what did he make, the WH word still needs to be in the initial position, but then you get subject auxiliary inversion. So you cannot, you don't say what Ben was, but you have to invert them. What was Ben? There is still subject verb agreement, however. What was Ben? What were they? As you can see, even though the order is changed, um, we still have falling intonation. And as you know, if there is no auxiliary, there is a bigger rule in English which says you need do support. So you cannot say what make he, because make is not an auxiliary verb. It doesn't fit the constraint of subject auxiliary inversion. So you go for do support. What did he make? The whole thing, however, still has the meaning of a WH question. It's an information question for one specific piece of information. In contrast to this, polarity questions, yes or no questions, ask for an answer that is yes or no. So out of two options. Was Ben tired? Yes, he was. No, he wasn't. Did he make mistakes? Yes, he did. No, he didn't. In yes or no interrogative clause constructions, the constraints are that you have subject auxiliary inversion. So again, if you don't have an auxiliary, you need do support. And there's subject verb agreement. As we've already seen, was Ben tired? Were they tired? But this time you get a rising intonation. Was Ben tired? Did he make mistakes? And that signals to the hero that it's a polarity question. Moving on to imperatives. There you have positive imperatives, stay awake, or negative ones, don't make mistakes. A positive imperative um, normally has no subject, which is why we can put it in parentheses and just a verb phrase. Stay awake, um, eat your beans, be happy. And they have a falling intonation. The meaning of it is that it's a positive directive. Negative imperatives always start with don't. Um, you, don't make mistakes, is a very rare sequence where you have the address C mentioned in the subject slot. So normally they start with don't and have a falling intonation. And then you know whatever follows is a negative directive. Imperatives are interesting because they've got a special constraint which you normally don't find in English. So look at this from Croft and Cruz who give you a taxonomy of English imperative constructions. At first this looks really complicated, but look at the bottom row. So jump, 
eat your beans is a verb phrase imperative. Be happy, be silly, be nice. All of these have be plus adjective um, in their verb phrase. And then you have the don't, the negative um, imperatives like don't jump, don't do this. Um, and the negative adjective ones with don't be cruel, don't be silly, don't be stupid. Now the interesting elements are the don't be adjective ones. Because remember, you need do support if you haven't got an auxiliary. But if you form a positive uh, imperative, be happy, you've got a form of to be plus the adjective. And if you say he is happy, what's the negative version of this in the declarative? He is happy, he isn't happy. So you've already got a form of to be where you could add the, the negator not. So why isn't it be not cruel? Why do you need don't um, do support with the imperatives in the negatives for adjectives? Well, that's a special constraint of the negative imperative constructions. It seems to be that throughout the history of English, there was a time when you could say be not cruel, but then the taxonomy was rearranged so that you always know a negative imperative starts with don't. And that overrides um, the more general rule that you have do support only if you haven't got an auxiliary. So there you can see how the meaning and how specific class constructions can override more general rules. And if you then look at the final taxonomy, then you can see it's clear cut. You've got positive imperatives and negative imperatives. Summing up. Clausal constructions are constraints over argument structure constructions, tense aspect, phrasal and word constructions. And in the next session, we will ask ourselves, how can we analyze full sentences using what we've learned so far? I will adopt what Thomas Herbst from the University of Erlangen and I called a constructionist approach to syntactic analysis, a way of having a visual representation of all the constructions that come together to combine into a single construct. Okay, I hope you're excited as I am about this and I will tell you all about it in our next session and the final session for this particular course on constructionist approaches to syntactic analysis. For now, I just want to thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you again soon.